Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to the Tortoise Future of Work Summit. I'm Emily Benn. I'm the Chief of Staff here at Tortoise, and I am delighted to be hosting this session uh, called The New Intergenerational Workplace, What Needs to Change? Um, if you haven't been to a Tortoise Thinking before, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, the purpose of Thinkings is that everyone has their chance to contribute. Uh, and we want to hear as many of your thoughts as possible. Uh, my colleague, Luke, uh, is going to be editing the chat in this session. Thank you very much, Luke. So please do make your contributions, um, have a debate, and, and I'll try and bring in as many of you uh, on camera to speak uh, as possible. Um, we're recording this discussion, as you may have heard when you joined, uh, so we can edit um, and we'll share, be able to share some of it for people that aren't able to join us um, in person. Uh, so without further ado, I'd love to get to the, we, I'm sure the session will go very quickly. So I want to get to the, the topic at hand. And um, we often hear, you know, the, the, the kind of stereotype that millennial workers have completely different expectations from older generations at work, whether that's demanding greater flexibility, faster promotions, more frequent sabbaticals. So I guess my question to start really is, is the talk of intergenerational differences really overdone? Are what younger workers, millennials, um, Gen Z workers really any different in what they want from their work and their professional careers as older generations? And are we missing the kind of wider fact, which is the aging demographics that the UK and many other countries are facing, the share of older workers in work, um, you know, rapidly rising? And do we have to kind of shift out our expectations of, of the stages of life and workplace, given, you know, we're not going to be retiring at at 60 and how do you um, ensure that uh, workers and uh, you know older generations of workers with um, in great experience are, are not lost in this kind of intergenerational battle? What does this mean for lifelong learning? What does it mean for diversity and the, the, the concept of diversity and in, in, um, equality and inclusion uh, and, and many more? Just some of the questions that I hope we will be exploring over the course of the next um, 45 minutes and I really am delighted to have four such brilliant people to join us to talk about these uh, issues today. We've got Sheree Atchison, who's a global diversity, equity and inclusion leader. Hi, Sheree, hi. Um, we've got Lisa Barrett, um, VP of Learning, Innovation and Operations at Multiverse, um, a, a wonderful partner for us here at Tortoise. Um, Jane Evans, founder of the Uninvisibility Project. Hi, Jane, and Carol Russell, founder of Fresh Voices UK. Uh, and I should say that Jane and Carol have written a book which is launch date is today, um, uh, Invisible to Invaluable. So firstly, many congratulations on, on launch day and thank you very much for, for coming us to us um, to, to celebrate. So con congrats. Um, if I, I might start with Lisa, actually, if that's uh, okay. Um, uh, lots of things to talk about, but I guess the first question is, is the stereotype that you do occasionally hear about millennial and younger workers of being upstart or impatient, is that in any way fair? Oh, such a great question. I, I, I guess in thinking about this panel, I was just thinking, how can I have this conversation and also honor the people that we're talking about? And so, so what I would say is it's at least a useful tool for us to talk about the perceptions. So it's at least a useful construct to say, okay, where did this come from and, and how do we look at this? But I think what's really interesting to me is just, just even preparing for this, I had to remind myself of what do we mean by millennials? So roughly the, the last, you know, 20 years, people between 20 and 40 years old. So we kind of a 20 year span and, and the words that come up, right. Are like the, the generation me tag got, got stuck in there and that's really stuck. Um, the words like entitled, confident, uh, promote me yesterday, that type of thing, right? So the, this is this is what we hear, and I think what's really interesting to me is look at is to look at what are these people committed to. So so what's driving this group of people? Again, if we can generalize, which is totally unfair, but let's just do it because that's a way to have a conversation. And and I think what's really interesting is if you look at what a human being is committed to, you get access to a very different way of of looking at them in general. So with with these folks. 
Um, again, if we can if we can say that, what I see is is one, and I, I should con I can to contextualize briefly to say that with our apprenticeship work, about half of our folks would fit in this category. So we work with a lot of people who who fit in this category and are upskilling in our programs, doing a professional apprenticeship with Multiverse. So that's um, part of where this information comes from. But what I see is, is one is these people, they really wanna have personal impact. So they're really committed to that they, they personally, what they're doing matters. And that creates a very different context from being a passive member of an organization. Um, second, authenticity, right? So these folks really care about authenticity. Is what you're saying just a message or is what you're saying an actual real thing that the organization believes that you're gonna stand behind? And, and, and that's really important because if you can tap into that, then actually you can, you can really harness um, something about this group. Because I would say this group is also very loyal if you get it right, right? So they're very loyal to the things that they see as authentic. The reason why you see things moving around a lot uh, or people moving around a lot is partly because you know, they're not feeling that. Um, uh, third is, is openness and collaboration. So they have an expectation of people in an organization that they work with, that they're gonna be open about what's going on. And that's really uncomfortable for a lot of us. So certainly for me, I was definitely not you know, brought up through organizations or even in my life to be open about challenges, admit what's not working. You know, we, I, we came from a looking good time period. So, so these people, folks asking us to be open is, is really, really different. Um, the fourth I would say is learning and development. So they're really committed to actually learning and growing themselves, developing. So again, you see lots of job moves, partly because people are saying, okay, well, yes, I'm, you know, I'm in this company, but I can learn more over here or go do more in this organization. Um, and again, there's something really interesting to tap into, because if we get that these folks are committed to learning, to growing, then how can organizations support that? And again, get that loyalty and have people see that within their organization, not outside of it. Um, and five is, is just, I would say, really empowered. So this is a group of people that believe that things can be different. They believe that other things are possible. So they're gonna be looking for opportunities to do that. So you can see how within, within those things, you, you could end up with some of the stereotypes, Emily. So things like, oh, again, these people are entitled or they want things to happen too quickly. But I think if we start from what, the, what we're committed to or what they're committed to, that it's a much more interesting conversation about how do you tap into that and how do you think about who these people are and what they're trying to do and how they can be a real asset in the organization. And then how do you work with the different dynamics, again, of, of leaders in an organization who, who aren't that way. So what do you do, what do, you do when you have a, a, a leadership level that's used to kind of, I tell you what to do and you do it. And um, uh, we're not gonna talk about the things that aren't working. And then the people kind of coming up through the organization really thrive on talking about what's not working and making that better. And I definitely want to come back to the questions about leadership and how this is a, a clearly a direct challenge to some of the old traditions of, of leadership and being open and it's a lot more vulnerable, etc. I just wanted to ask, given your particular experience with apprenticeships, how and, and actually, you know, some evidence that shows that, you know, apprenticeships stay on in organizations longer when they start. Uh, not least, I assume, because of the amount of you know, training and development and loyalty to your questions earlier. So I wanted just from the apprenticeships versus your traditional kind of graduate job, what the kind of difference is and what that tells us, if you could just go yeah, into that. That's right, that's right. So, um, so just again, for folks who aren't in this conversation every day about apprenticeships, a, a professional apprenticeship is where you're 100% full-time employed by a company. So you have you know, same salary and setup as other folks, but then you're getting trained about 20% of the time on the job in critical job skills and in, in, in mindset skill sets and behaviors for your organization. And, and that's what we do at Multiverse. So we partner with clients to do that. Um, so it's really interesting. I mean, the data show that apprentices versus uni university graduates stay on significantly longer. So some studies say about you know, one and a half times. Um, and, and part of that, what we, what we believe and what we're seeing is, again, it's that loyalty. So they're seeing their company invest in who they are and then they're, they're, they're giving that back, so, which we find really, really interesting. Um, a, there was a piece in the Times yesterday that said a survey of people said that 42% of people believe that a, a professional apprenticeship or an apprenticeship is more useful than a university degree. And I think in this conversation, that's about, again, coming back to these folks are practical. They're, they want to have an impact. They want, they want to do something meaningful. They don't want to take a bet on going to a you know, four-year or three-year college or university and then get out on the other side and say, gosh, what, you know, what am I going to do with this? We've got a hungry set of people um, to do that. And the, the last thing I, I guess I would say, Emily, which I find really interesting is there's also, um, you know, anytime you've got a group of people who've got these big ideas and want to really change things, then it's also about equipping them with the skills to do that. So, so part of what we do, for example, is we work with people coming into an organization 
and um, uh, uh, we've got about 500 people who've gone through our, our business operations uh, apprenticeship where they are, they are, we're training them how to be great employees when they come in. So yes, you've got these big ideas, but first you have to perform well in your job. And that's a way to have an impact. You have to be able to work with a line manager. That's a way to have an impact. This may or may not be fair. So I'm going to say it. And I hope it, I hope everyone takes it the right way. But sometimes I think about um, people, you know, at that stage of their career. I used to work with 11 year olds um, in certain contexts and they'd have these brilliant ideas about, you know, poverty and environmental impact and how to change the world, but they couldn't pack a suitcase. Like they couldn't, they couldn't like put clothes in the suitcase in their right way, but they had, you know, they, they wanted to do a lot of things. So again, it's totally, it's not really fair, um, but if you'll be generous with me, I think there's there's an equivalent to that of, of, you know, people with big ambitions who really care about making changes also need the practical skills to be able to do that effectively and figure out how to work within, you know, larger context to have an impact, which often, you know, involves some not glamorous things and some really basic things that you, you got to do well. Absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. I, I'll, I'll come back to you and I, not least because I want to talk about also some of the kind of differences in British and American work culture and how this impacts on it. If I can turn to Cherie now, um, please. Uh, Lisa was talking about um, how people were impatient for change, uh, you know, wanted things to be done yesterday when things aren't right, wanting to change it. That obviously leads to a discussion about diversity and inclusion in the workforce. And also uh, what you we were talking about digital and data. And I know this is very much part of your speciality, how you use data strategies uh, and openness and transparency. Um, so I wondered if you could just give a, a kind of overview of, 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 you know, how in talking about diversity, data, openness, and everything um, to do with what you've, uh, you've learned so far. Yeah, I mean, I think that the key, the key thing here is that the mindset around what work is changes with people, it changes with expectations in society, and it changes with what we then expect backwards. Um, what I think is really important is the understanding that actually when we talk about supporting different workforces and different backgrounds, different people, everything and anything in between, that we really recognize that a lot of the time we're benchmarking against something that very simply didn't work for the people before as well, but actually was accepted because of various different reasons, different cultures, different approaches to work and certainly with my work in diversity and inclusion which is really holding organizations to account around creating workplaces for everyone i work with a hell of a lot of tech companies um, and financial services and everything in between and in my book demanding more as well i really drill down into actually why we must listen and we must listen really really regularly on what people want and how they want it people i think have this this view of entitlement but actually it's just very clearly voicing this actually doesn't work and it doesn't work for a broad spectrum of people many people in the past have accepted it because of the reasons that we know exist around financial stability around not having that opportunity to voice it but we're in a world now where as we've seen millennials and certainly gen z are choosing where to work based on work fitting around them as opposed to work being that dominant factor in life and, and inclusion is is key to all of this because we're talking about an intergenerational workforce we're talking about people that both want flexibility and maybe don't that people have caring responsibilities and people have different responsibilities that a blanket package of benefits now does not work because simply people need different things, priorities shift and change. And the only way that organizations can really answer to that and to allow their employees to demand more is to actually sit back and listen and really genuinely listen as opposed to listening to senior leadership only, which will give you a very skewed view of what's important given the usual demographic of that group and the usual age group of that group, but actually listening to everyone and forming a strategy of support and engagement around that anything else is just not inclusive um and it's really key that actually we're going through a, a transition of people being willing to demand more and actually say this doesn't work for me and we're seeing more people of the older generation as well becoming more comfortable with that and i think that's a huge positive step because we shouldn't live to work if we don't want to and this is the, the key part the key pivotal moment that i think we're in right now yeah, absolutely. Especially as a lot of us felt like the last year we haven't been working from home. We've been living at work and that's changed priorities in many respects. I'm interested in your point about listening to people 
how what what are the ways that companies and organizations can actually do it well rather than the just listening to senior leaders <laughs> or rather than the staff surveys that you know people have done for you know years and years and people talk about employee voice there are you know people talk about using data what are the kind of strategies and actual structures that you've seen that work best yeah i mean employee engagement is a really key part of this um because you should be able to understand how people from different demographics feel around fair opportunities around non-discrimination around a sense of belonging and so on and the only way you can do that is by actively and continuously asking them through an, an engagement platform, whatever that may be. People use simple surveys, which you know maybe you send once a year. What I feel now is not how I will feel in one month's time, in a quarter, in six months, and so on. But the key thing of actually when you get that data is making sure that you're breaking it down by different groups. How do, for example, let's say you're a global company, how do black women in the UK feel versus black women in the US? How do people that are disabled feel versus non-disabled people? How do they feel about benefits and so on versus their different counterparts? And the key reason for that is actually, if you don't get that granular level of analytics, what you'll find from your surveys is you get a really high percentage of positive feedback because it is heavily skewed towards the majority of your organization, which is highly likely to be those from financially stable, heterosexual white men backgrounds. Now, the key point here is that we drill further than that. And that's what I do. I work is heavily data-driven with empathy embedded in that. Um, and there's lots of tools to do this. A lot of people assume that when I say listening, I mean like listening on a one-to-one -one call. That doesn't scale. That gives you a very small view of what's happening. And also when you consider the the barrier to entry to that, the barrier to being willing to say, hi, I really don't like what's happening here. I would really like to share that. I would like to rate this lower, et cetera. That takes a lot of psychological safety. It also takes a lot of privilege. And again, when we don't prioritize psychological safety in these listening sessions and so on, in these listening platforms, we can't do it. Um, now, certainly I led inclusion at PECON, which is an employee engagement platform, recently and the work that we did there was really understanding and developing a solution that allows you to listen and give every employee a voice but break it down and provide insights in a way that actually we can see how people are viewing different things these are some things that we think you need to do and that's really key in this work brilliant thank you and, and you know lots of thoughts about how you recognize the demands and in individual circumstances with the kind of generalization and I know in many of the stuff that we're talking about, we do run the risk of going into, into generalizing, but uh, uh, we definitely think we need to be mindful of that in the conversation. So thank you very much for, for pointing it out. Um, I'll come back to, to, to pick up on many of it, but, but Jane, I just wanted to bring you in um, now. We, we've talked a lot about younger workers and younger generation <laughs> missing out, given that a third of the workforce is already um, you know, over 50. We are, we are missing out quite a large section of the workforce. And, uh, what I found so striking about um, reading to about the uninvisibility project as a large part of your work is we talk about the COVID pandemic, but you talk um, so passionately about the epidemic of underemployment and, invis and invisibility for all midlife women in particular. Um, and, you know, there's a big debate as to how the impact of the last 15 months is disproportionately on younger women, but clearly there's a big disproportionate impact on older women too, given the nature of employment. So I wondered if I start with that and then we will dive in a bit, um, dive a bit more. Uh, yes, look, it's it's really interesting. There is actually, you know, there's great figures of over 50, but they're very rarely um, broken down for gender. There is a perception in the workforce that the next round of redundancy, all women over 45 are going to be going. And that's not just from um, from 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 um, the, the other employees. The women themselves are believing it, too. So, you know, they're the ones that are dreading the next round of redundancies. Um, you know, we've had a lot of talk in this call, uh, you know, about training millennials. Um, and they say that the future of employment is lifelong learning and multiple careers. Um, and yet that doesn't that doesn't seem to be available for us um, now again one of the things that people don't seem to realize is on the day that queen became number one with um, bohemian rhapsody was the day that we got equal opportunities 
So we're actually seeing the first generation of women that are actually, you know, going past menopause um, in a workforce. Um, and so there's a societal perception that there is no place for us. Um, and, you know, the thing is, is that if the, one of the cruelest things in the world for women is that the sweet spot for a career is 35. Now, if we extend that to 55, it gives us all so much more space, um, but it also allows us women that are going on the other side of menopause where we've got more energy, we've got more testosterone, um, you know, and we've got all of this incredible experience um, that we're being thrown onto the scrap heap which again is incredibly cruel for our generation because we fought for things like paid maternity leave and sexual harassment legislation, but didn't have them ourselves. So we're now facing a generation of women that have a third of the pension savings of men and 48% have no pension savings at all. Um, and the Center for Better Aging last year um, predicted that for the over 50s, one in 10 men are in danger of losing their job at the end of furlough, but eight out of 10 women are. So, you know, we're actually going to be facing a massive societal problem of a generation of women, the pioneers of careers for women, that are going to be retiring in poverty. Um, so we need to actually take action on this now. And what, are the, what is the action that you are, that you write about in your book and that, you, you know, all of the work that you've done, what is the action now? Well, first of all, is, is to let women know that it's not just them. Um, you know, a lot of women face this and believe that it's just them. It's actually happening to a hell of a lot of us. Um, but we're actually putting our words into action. So, um, you know, we, um, the Uninvisibility Project is working with WPP and the Brixton Finishing School, who bring, you know, young, um, young people from disadvantaged backgrounds into digital marketing. Um, and we're changing their course to, for women over 45 to bring them into digital marketing. And, you know, WPP have actually ring-fenced ring 20 jobs for these women um, at the end of the year. Um, so, you know, there are so many areas with so many, you know, they say that most of the jobs that will appear in 10 years don't actually exist yet. So, you know, we should be training these women um, to give them a chance um, to solve their own problems rather than letting society solve a problem of a generation with half of us retiring in poverty. Can I, can I just bring your co-author, Carol, to, to pick this up? To, Carol, given your very long um, experience in the film, television industry, script writing, uh, so much to talk about, about representation, but how the industry can help bring out some of these voices given the invisibility problem that, you know, Jane has just, um, uh, you know, said so, said so well. Oh, with that. The, oops, sorry. Oh, yes, one of the things I'm doing with, with my company, Fresh Voices UK, is looking at uh, women, black women in particular, over 45, um, and playwrights, and bringing their voices, not just to the stage, but to the screen. Because there's a, there is a truth, I believe, in if you can't, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And it's really important that these women's voices get an airing, because the stories that they will tell will be about, for example, the fact that actually we've got more in common with millennials than we don't. Um, especially black women have embraced a portfolio uh, career forever. So like my, my, my mother was um, a dressmaker. She worked in a factory, um, but she'd also do hair or she'd make cakes to make extra money. And there are lots of black women who did that kind of thing over the years and they passed that down to their to their children too so i am or i also have a portfolio career i've always had a portfolio career i've always done many different things including uh, management consultancy uh, storytelling um writing for film and television uh, being an actor that i've done so many different things that i am really comfortable with the idea of uh, being a freelancer and moving myself to the jobs that I want to do. And so I absolutely recognize uh, myself in millennials and feel that, as I said, there's more that brings us together than keeps us apart. Yeah, I, I wonder whether actually in, in, in even some of the way that we've framed this, we run the risk of exacerbating differences when actually demanding better uh, is something that's universal. It's not 
and and you know rather than you know try and pit ages against each other we are we should recognize the common difficulties and differences um, uh, and uh, realize that actually a strategy that works for, for everyone is the, what, the thing that's really going to change. Absolutely. And I, I love one of the things that uh, Jane and I have been talking about for years, uh, which is that, um, as she said, the sweet spot for a career is around 35. And that's because um, we base that around men. 35 is about the age where women are going, no, I need to have my babies now. I want to have my babies now, if they want to have babies. And what happens is that they are then sort of sucked out, can be pulled out of their career. And what we suggest is what may be really good is if you look at the other end of the spectrum where we are in our 50s, we could step into those spaces that those women have um, have been uh, have been in, and give them the space and the time to have their babies, bring up some their children to a certain age, whatever they're happy with, and then come back to work. And then we step back and go right, okay, we just we just kept the seat warm for you. There are lots of different ways, that I believe anyway, that we can help each other. And and I prob I probably instinctively know. Can I just ask the sweet spot comment that you and Jane have? made the just to just so I, we know exactly what it is that you're um referring to um it's the point at which um it's the point at which your career is at its heights where it's where you're just about to you could take right off and go into um the stratosphere so it's i'm losing my words right now but um Jane, step in, because just. Um, what we find with younger women is, is they're always feeling as though they're on the clock. They've got to get into university. They've then got to go and get a job. They've got to, you know, if they're going to find a partner, they've got to find a partner. They've got, you know, they've, they're all on this clock of 35. Um, but also, you know, they're, they're then having children and trying to be superwoman. They're trying to do everything, they're, you know, and... And it's just such a major pressure for them. And, and we see a lot of women making decisions out of fear, that a fear that they're going to lose their career. Can I do motherhood and career? Um, and so, you know, we're if we can extend that sweet spot, if we can, you know, if, if you know, because currently at the moment, women are trying to be super women. And then we're, by the time their children are ch teenagers, their jobs are over. So, you know, we're saying we, they've got to be able to see that there's a longer term future for them, that maybe they can plateau their career a little bit, that they're not going to go off the, you know, the, tr the career track that they're on if they plateau for a little while, um, yeah. you know. And so really it is about, we, we, you know, again, our careers were all based on, the, on, a, on, on a timeline that we were going to die at 70. Yeah. We're now, you know, going to be living till 90 or 100. No, so, no. So, so we, we do have to, have to push that, push all stages of life back. In, we have to, we in have youth. to. Um, I, well, as someone that's 31, certainly now feeling a slightly more pressure if I've only got four years left to get to this um, sweet spot. I wanted to bring in a couple of contributions from our uh, listeners and our audience first and then get some reflections from the panelists. Can I go to Helen Reeve Morris, please? Uh, if you are here. Yes, yes, I am. Hi, Helen. Hi. Thanks for joining us. I know you made you uh, reading your contribution in the chat talking about do we need to kind of change our what we consider success at work to be? And I guess this goes to the topic of or people demanding different different priorities. So I wondered if you want to just expand on your point. Sure. And I think it actually picks up on a lot of what Carol and Jane have just been discussing as well about taking kind of a longer term view of career. Um, I'm definitely one of those women who hit the kind of 35 bit, had a baby and then kind of career fell apart. So I guess it's kind of come from a personal experience. But I guess my view was that <clears throat> currently success in organisations is often defined in terms of financial success, status, kind of getting to that director level or earning enough money so that you're not constantly like watching the pennies. And I think as one of someone else has said in the chat that actually for a lot of people, it really is just trying to make it through month by month. They're spending so much money just being able to live that there's this kind of real desire to kind of progress and develop and kind of get out of that kind of that kind of real scary bit as quickly as possible. Um, but actually, 
what that kind of may what, what my kind of thinking is is that what that does is it kind of engenders this kind of um kind of focus on burnout like then people end up burning out quite quickly people feel under so much stress and pressure and that's why we're getting these rising cases of burnout of kind of clinical cases of mental ill health and so perhaps success there should be more about sustainability and we we're talking a lot about this in terms of kind of physical sustainability but shouldn't it also be about social sustainability and human sustainability so thinking about making decisions today for your career but not at the expense of your kind of future self and i just would love kind of some panelist perspectives on on that really i guess that kind of view of should we be trying to change what we we see as work success brilliant thanks very much and can i get sharice um Perspective first, and I go to Lisa and then Karen and Jane. Yeah, of course. I mean, I absolutely agree that we should be challenging what success means because success means so much for different people. Um, I also think what we have overall in general, the, the vision of success has, and I say success in quotes, has been defined from a very privileged lens and usually from a very privileged lens when it comes to socioeconomic background as well. So typically we're talking about wealth, we're talking about hierarchy, and we're talking about um, seniority and so on. And a lot of those things um, are much more attainable for different groups of people. And I touched on those groups earlier as well. And I think that the problem with that is that we set society we set people coming into the workforce we set people that are shifting in the workforce we set people that have left and are coming back and all of the different kinds of people that we have at the moment um up for failure a lot of the time because we have this very rigid very like in a box view of what success is um and it's very different and i say that as someone who is 30 who isn't having kids and has a very successful career already um, what's successful for me will not be the same as someone even at the same age as me who does want to have children, who does have X, Y, Z that I don't have and so on and so forth. And that's why it's really um, key that we really challenge that. And for me to really challenge that from a, a, a what's the word, a logistical perspective, it's really, really key that we really deeply analyze and interrogate promotion processes and progression processes, that we spend time actually from a training managers, understanding that not everyone wants X, Y, Z, and this is how you support everybody, not just your view of high performers and so on as well, because like we said, success isn't the same for everybody, and that is also incredibly okay. Absolutely. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you wanted to touch on that at all or... Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I mean, I'm, I'm really enjoying all the comments. I think, I mean, I think one thing that I think about in terms of success is the, the idea of false trade-offs. And I think sometimes we, it's easy to get in a position where you think, okay, you know, we can either give people uh, the traditional you know, progression and management structure and route where you do this and you, you're entirely focused on your career and you have to sacrifice everything else, you know, or we can give them more balance and we can't do both. And I, and I actually think that that is contradictory to the research and to what we know to be true about people. So if you can tap into what really motivates people and get alignment, then that's where you get high levels of success. And I think there's, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm American, so I think it's, you know, kind of even on overdrive coming from an American culture, I should say I'm British and American now, but grew up in the, in the US is this idea of, um, you know, having to be successful in your career as a key part of your identity. And I think it is a part of your identity, but keeping that in context, but also tapping into your entire identity to make you more successful. So there's, um, you know, there, there was, I, I was involved with a company that did work where they actually asked all their employees coming in, what is it that motivates you? What do you really care about? And then they use that to align. So for example, for working moms, you know, you could think, oh gosh, that's, you know what, don't ask that question. Don't want to go there because then you're going to have to deal with, you know, these work-life balance issues, but it's not the case at all because actually then you can help them use that as a uh, motivator of how can they be more efficient? How can they structure their time in a way that works? And also how can they get all their needs met? So they're not worrying about that stuff because how much of our time, do we spend worrying about things where that's taking up brain space where actually we should, you know, we should be able to be in action. So by surfacing some of those conversations and getting that out on the table, I think that's really important. And then the, just the other point that I wanted to make is about, about access, because I think there's a, there's a key thing here. I mean, we're having this conversation about, you know, how things move through, but there's still a fundamental access issue that I don't think we've talked quite as much about, which is to say, 
you know, if you look at pipelines coming into organizations, they're still very much biased toward and selecting for traditional indicators of achievement and traditional profiles, not based on evidence and data of what actually makes people successful and high performance. So, you know, achievement isn't you got into the school, you got this GPA. Achievement is given the factors you had and in context, you know, do you have a track record of going above and beyond? Can you can you conquer in almost any circumstances? Do you see yourself as personally responsible as personally responsible? So I think that's really, really critical. And that and that's part of, I mean, it's interesting because our multiverse journey really follows the journey of this conversation, which is we started by looking at access for 16 to 24 year olds. How do you create those training opportunities and entry routes in the companies? And actually now about half the people we've had in the last year are not, they're, they're not people who are just starting in their career. They're people who are, who are who are already in their organization who need to be developed. So there's an access point there as well. So actually, you know, for us, a, pro, a professional apprenticeship is for someone at any age, you know, our oldest apprentices are in their sixties, but they need, well, people need to keep retraining. So there's that access question of, you know, how do you ensure that people are getting the training and the development they need? And then they can have choices, right? And then there's a conversation called, well, what do I want that to look like? And how do I structure my life? But if you don't even have the access points there in the first place, then you can't even have that conversation called, well, you know, how do I make everything in my life work? And a complete challenge to the normal way that organizations thought about access points to their own organizations. I mean, exactly. Um, Jane, I wanted, wondered if you wanted to respond to Helen's um, point uh, and indeed anything that Lisa just uh, mentioned too. Um, look, I think, you know, we, we all agree with, with, with um, you know, the training for everybody. I think it's fantastic that what she's doing. Um, um, so I don't know whether I've got much to sort of add at this point. Um, but, you know, again, having, you know, we work intergenerationally intergener in our company. And I mean, we had a meeting yesterday with some young guys and they were like, we really look forward to our meeting with you each week. It's actually the meeting we look forward to the most um, because you're so much fun. Um, and I think, you know, again, these, these intergenerational differences is, you know, because you're not seeing us, you're not actually realizing what we have to offer. Yeah. And, you know, and I think, you know, anybody that's in an organization, you know, should be looking, you know, how many people above them have they got, you know, is it just management that are over 50, um, you know, and should be fighting for it because ultimately it's their future too. Um, thanks very much. Carol, is there anything you wanted to touch on first? Uh, and then I'm going to go to Tree Elvin for a question after. I, um, yes, the thing I suppose I'd really like to add is, is what Helen was talking about in terms of um, mental health and burnout, burnout issues. Because I, I really do think that, that opening up and stretching that working, since we already have to think about ourselves as working right now until 67, soon it will be 70. If we stretch the period in which we are working, and if we, as women, I'm talking about specifically, and if we don't feel that we have to rush like, um, like Usain Bolt to get to a particular um, stage in our in our career before we can have our children, then there is more. There, not only is there more ease, but actually, I think we're more productive. Thanks very much, Carol. Um, Tree, I just wanted to come to you because you made a very interesting question. We talked about data, we've talked about lots of things uh, and how to use digital technology in, in employee engagement, etc. You asked a very good question about are there gener generational differences to do with data and privacy? And so I wondered if you could ask the question and, and in fact, your own response to it first. I'd actually forgotten that was my question. There's so much interesting stuff coming out. And I was thinking, I've got all these notes here, like are men under different pressures and men and women perceived differently, you know, the different ages each way. And um, yeah, no, I, I do wonder if that is an issue though. The whole thing about data and privacy, for example, um, you know, Amazon workers or similar, oh gosh, shouldn't be naming and shaming, but um, you know, workers who are, there's so much AI and going, going on around monitoring, tracking employees which, you know, how healthy is that? And what I'm hearing from these sessions is that there is, there is a great concern for, you know, creating a healthier approach to, to the workplace in general. And I just wondered if younger generations are aware in the same way, you know, generations who, digital natives, who are used to just sort of signing up for all the latest apps, having the latest kit, not too worried if there's facial recognition installed all over their devices because they haven't actually thought those things through. 
And I just wondered if it was just interesting to me. I'm, I'm genuinely interested to know what everybody present, um, you know, feels about that. Is there is there a difference? I think I asked another question, which was why is the is this apparently so predominantly female? So I've kind of got muddled there. I apologise if that's the case, but both to me very interesting questions. No, and, and you're, I was so struck that the point about data was so striking because it's it's actually a, it's an argument I have with my own parents who are uh, sometimes very concerned about the amount of data that I am giving away both personally and then when you put it in a professional context it becomes a whole other conversation. So I, I, can I go to um, Lisa first? Um, on the on the, the the data question and yes so so the question being what is there a generational difference around yeah is there a generational difference and is this something that we need to think about more widely yeah well it's really interesting because i don't know if folks know but i i actually led digital identity for the british government for the year before i joined this so i thought a lot about data and privacy. <laughs> i thought you might have done <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know um, I and and it, i mean so i'd say i'd say two things so i think i think that there's the people who are most concerned about privacy actually tend to be older. So they tend to be people who have gone through and had experiences and lived through um, uh, issues and times where they've seen what happens when people, you know, give away personal data or governments get too much control. So there's, so there's a the kind of the vanguards of, of privacy can be in cases actually not in what we would call the millennial generation. Again, just looking at the trends. Um, but what's so what's interesting about the the, um, the 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 younger generation is just that familiarity and fluency with technology and 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 use of giving away. I mean, think about how nervous we used to be to put a picture on Facebook. Now think about how much is already out there. So there was I remember a specific point in time where things shifted from politicians being very nervous about pictures being published about them, where that was the end of your career, or your campaign, right? They found this picture of you in this you know situation at some party, and you know that was it. Now it's expected that it's going to come out, um, that there will be things because most people can't live to be, you know, 40, 50, however old, and not have pictures that, that are somewhat embarrassing. So it's more about how you control that narrative, right? So there's there's a thing about we're used to giving away our, our, our information and our, and our data, and the younger generations are especially used to that and actually not um, particularly cautious about it. But also the solutions are coming from, you know, people who are in that category. So the people who, who are, you know, brilliant engineers and really understand, you know, most people don't still under, understand what blockchain is. They don't understand what digital identity is. They don't understand, uh, you know, the differences between these things. Um, uh, so, so, the, so the solutions, uh, you know, are coming out, out of that group as well that are actually able to build technology that incorporates um, privacy solutions. So I think, I think there's something about, if we go back to, you know, what, what, if, we're, if we're talking about um, millennials, you think about, again, that openness, that authenticity, they're used to a level of, of openness, like that's their default. And then the question is, you know, how do you, how do, you do that in a way that um, is responsible? I have done what I knew was going to happen, which is run out of time for uh, much more. But uh, it, it, my colleague, um, Tess Murray, made a very good point. So I'm gonna, my final question to um, you all, which is we've heard a lot of great ideas at, really in the kind of millennial way of wanting to demand change and wanting to make change better what is it that actually works and the one pick one thing that could be done now that we should be demanding uh whether in in and it doesn't have to be just about younger workers at all the whole point about this session i think has shown how there are issues of demanding better across workforces so there's one thing that can really shift culture and change in organizations um shuri i'll ask you first to put you on the spot <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I guess very quickly, the first thing that I will say to leadership, to people that are employees and everybody in between is to don't feel like you have to continually benchmark against what is happening. We can set new benchmarks um, and we should certainly do that. Um, break things, put them back together in different ways. That's what I do every day. And I think that's what organizations really need to do moving forward instead of just taking this this benchmark of where we're at and that's where we're staying because it's not and it doesn't work brilliant thank you very much um jane can i go to you next the beers, uh. Um, I would say uh, do what the Brixton Finishing School is. They had training courses for 18 to 24 year olds. And they're now extending it 45 plus. So, you know, there is a, there's so much training out there for younger people. It does not take much to, you know, sort of white label it, rejig re it um, and make it open for, for, for every generation. Um, Carol. Carol. 
Jane said it, it's about retraining for me. Um, everybody should be given the opportunity throughout their working life to train and retrain um, because we may be in a job that we think we love now and in five, 10 years time, it's not the job for us anymore. We need the space. We need to know that if we want to retrain, that that, op op that option is there. Great, and Lisa, to the point about training, it's almost made for you that. Uh, <laughs> it, it is, I mean, I think uh, absolutely. It, it, it's thinking about the employer as responsible now for our development in lots of ways. So, so yes, you go to school until a certain age, but then the rest of your life, you're working for an organization and organizations being responsible for that development. I would just couple that though with organizations have to get real about the fact that as humans, we are fundamentally hardwired to hide. Like that is hardwired. You hide what you're not good at. You hide what you're embarrassed about. So as we're, you know, we have thousands of apprentices training in data, but what we're finding is if we're not training everyone else in the organization, how to have those conversations and not be embarrassed about what those data say, you know, not hide or ask, silly questions like I don't understand how the algorithm works that is not the culture in most companies so if we want to fundamentally change the conversation and organizations and a lot of other things then we have to start teaching ourselves and, and having a conversation about how do I stop hiding because by the way it's never going to go away you're going to you're going to stop hiding for, from something and then a month later you're going to do it again because that's how you're hardwired and we just don't want to look silly that you know that, that's how we are but the more we practice then the more we can be open about it. Absolutely, and that's a lesson for, for life, not just for professional um, life, Lisa. And th thank you everyone so much for your contributions. Thank you so much, Jane, Lisa, Sheree, and Carol. I'm sorry I didn't get to all your questions. I just saw Lynn wrote a very good point about, uh, we haven't mentioned the fact that women still don't have equal pay, uh, a small issue that deserves slightly more <laughs> attention than my last uh, comment, but uh, thank you for raising it. A lot of talk about the the, the balancing the, the the kind of individual story against having to generalize um, how demanding better should be, you know, a, a, a part of working culture, full stop, not just left to any one age demographics, and how we just have to push back our expectations of life stages because we're still working on a timeline that is slightly old. Um, uh, thank you very much um, uh, again, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted that we are now going to hand. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Chris Cook. Um, there may be a short break, uh, but Chris is going to be leading a discussion, I think very pertinent to what we talked about, uh, striking ahead, who will hold the power, employer or employee. So um, hopefully we set up that conversation quite well for you, Chris. Um, if you're not a member of Tortoise, please join us. Please stick around for the last session. And thank you very much to our panelists and all of you for what has been a really, really interesting um, and a very, uh, made me think about my own timeline and what I want from work um, more than anything. So thank you very much and I'll see you very soon.